your mom and dad, so it's really a pleasure for me to be here in his church and see so many of his parishioners and know that he's happy, and it makes me happy. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today and the nice things that have been said about me by a lot of you that have come up and talked to me. You're very kind. I want to talk to you about some issues that are dear to me. And I want to start with saying to you all that the members of a family, such as the family of this parish, or any family, should be at peace with each other. Today, I see a nation as a family. That's the way I look at our nation. That ideal shines across all generations of our history and all ages of our American dream. Whereas the Apostle Paul wrote long ago in Romans, if it be possible, as much as it lieth with you, live peacefully with all people. But in America today, we are losing our way as a nation regarding this American dream and Paul's instruction. I was raised in a family, in a family tradition of caring about other people, a belief in equality for all humans, and a belief that individual duty is bound by ethics and duty to our fellow man. On my mother's side, my grandfather was a Baptist minister. He founded each and every YMCA in Siberia. He married a Russian lady who was a Christian as well. All of her family that weren't able to escape were murdered by the communists. My grandfather and grandmother came here and my grandfather founded three different Baptist missions in Alabama, in Georgia, and in South Carolina. He was a great man. My grandmother learned the prejudice of the Southern white because she was Russian, even though she was a white man. And my grandfather, a devoted Baptist and principal of the middle school, <laughs> taught in his church against that kind of hatred. I am the fifth straight firstborn male of the same name to hold a law license in North Carolina, continually since 1836. Joseph Blanchester first, the first was sent to read the law by the man who owned the largest plantation in the Northeastern North Carolina. He read the law and came back home and was called to the Lord. And he told the man who owned the plantation that he couldn't help him anymore, that he was called to the ministry. The plantation owner gave him a horse and a buggy, told him he'd need it, and that he was a fool. He went on to found almost all of the Episcopal churches in northeastern North Carolina. He ended up in Tarboro. And before the Civil War, he integrated his church, Calvary Church, in Tarboro. It's a great story of how he did it. He recognized that his church service was boring and pious. And he allowed the slaves to use his church on Sunday evening. And he realized that their service was fun and uplifting and joyous. And he noticed that his parishioners would kind of walk through the garden around the church on Sunday evenings. And he noticed that the crowd got bigger as the years and months went by. And so he decided that he would invite the slaves if they were able to free. Free being they were off work. To come to his church on Sundays and sit in the balcony. And they started doing that. It was a tradition for years. When I was a little boy, that was a tradition. 
So then on Sunday evenings, he would invite the white folks in his parish to come sit in the balcony while the black folks had their service. And before he knew it, the white folks were standing up singing. And so he decided, let's just get together. And they all got together. His son was Joseph Love Cheshire II. And you Episcopalians don't know him, but you know of him. He was the Bishop of North Carolina. He founded most of the Episcopal churches in the western part of the state. He brought the African Episcopalian Methodist Episcopalian Church together as the first bishop in the United States to do so with the Episcopal Diocese. He was a great man who believed in goodness and fairness and forgiveness and equality. His son, Joseph Blanchester III, was the chancellor of the Episcopal Church for years. And he ran during the Depression a soup kitchen in his house for poor people. His son, my father, Joseph Blanchester IV, was the chancellor of the Episcopal Church for, I think, 37 years. He was an interesting man because after he died, they had a mass for him with two bishops. And Bishop Estill was going to give the speech for my daddy, and he called me up and he said, Joe, I don't know how to capture your father. I don't know how to capture your father from the pulpit. I'm having a real problem with it. I said, well, Bishop Estill, you knew my daddy better than anybody in the whole world. He said, well, that's not the problem. He said, the problem is, I don't know how to capture your father without saying the words, God damn it. <laughs> my dad, my dad led the fight for the integration of the North Carolina State Bar Association. And I was telling somebody in here this evening, I was blackballed in our family fraternity at Chapel Hill because of that fight. I was also born into a family that received many blessings. The words of Luke about such blessings were taught to me at an early age. To whom much has been given, much is required. And to whom much has been entrusted, even more demanded. Those words are meant for us. I've always believed in those words, although I'm not sure being one for whom those words apply as a blessing or curse. I asked Jamie while we were having dinner here, one of the things I want to ask God, if I have a chance, if I die and lucky to, why did you make life so hard on kind, gentle, forgiving, loving people? Why is it so much harder for them than it is for those people that don't care? When I was 12, my grandfather, Joseph Blanchester III, he was deaf and he was going senile slipping into senility and shortly after died and he called me to his bed when he first got sick and he said to me son i want to give you the secret of life and what you must do and i of course was a little boy I was, he was in bed i was nervous and scared and he said god gives everybody the ability to help someone. He said, some people have the ability maybe only to help one or two. Some people have the ability to help scores. Some hundreds, some thousands, some 10,000, some millions. And all I want for you to understand is when you are lying where I'm lying now, and you know that you're about to go meet your maker, that you have helped as many people as you can. If you can do that, you can go in peace. You can know you had a good life. These were the essence of my childhood teachings. In elementary school, th this isn't meant to brag, this is meant to just tell you. In elementary school, I was the kid that protected the fat and the nerdy and the unathletic. <laughs> Two of my absolutely best friends, were Rody Kidwell and Bill Carmine. Rody probably had a bad disease that we didn't even understand back in those times. 
He was a nerd. He couldn't run. He'd fall down when he ran. He was smart. But everybody picked on him. And Bill was big and fat. Not because he ate a lot, but because he was big and fat. <laughs> and everybody picked on him. And I protected him. I got in fights. I went to their house and played with them when no one else would go. In fact, I went to their houses all the time. I was sent off to Groton School in Massachusetts for a good Episcopalian education when I was 12 years old. The year I was gone, I get choked up when I say this, the year I was gone, both Rhodey and Bill killed themselves <gasps> because of bullying. I ride by their old houses every Christmas. I stop, say a prayer, and cry. I've always felt responsible for their deaths. I rarely tell this in public, but my leaving them alone haunts me to this day. And I have hated bullies with an enormous passion for my entire life. Groton's an Episcopal school. At Groton, we studied every semester, we studied theology every semester for six years. We attended church services eight times a week every day and twice on Sunday. We also read and studied philosophy and human emotion. I read and studied every passage in the Bible, sometimes because I wanted to, sometimes because I had to. I sang in the choir. Our choir even recorded the Messiah with the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. I loved my religious experience at Groton. Our pastors were the essence of Christianity. My three most important moments at Groton were the beauty and the peace that I found in the religious teachings. I was reading the diary of Anne Frank and spending time with Dr. Martin Luther King. When Dr. King was asked, he was great friends of our headmaster, to come speak at Groton. Our headmaster asked me, because I was a little 15-year-old southern white boy, to show him around the school. So I got to spend an hour and a half with Dr. Martin Luther King all by myself. And I'll never forget that he asked me what was it like being a little, this was back in 1962, three. The world was different for the ones of us that are older in 1962. Television wasn't even big. The North and the South were different. We didn't drive through strip, mall, strip malls with all the same stores. It was a different place. He said to me, what's it like being a little Southern boy up here with all these Yankees? <laughs> and I said, well, Dr. King, you know, it's really hard. He said, these people up here think we're all stupid. They think we all wear bib overalls and we all hate black people and we're all dumb and mean. And he said, you know, I understand that. Son, you're learning something about prejudice, aren't you? Well, I thought Dr. King was like an old man. He was about 35. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yes, sir, I guess, I guess so. He said to me, he said, you know, I might prefer Southern prejudice to Northern prejudice. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, Southern people hate us as a race and love us as people. Yankees love us as a race and hate us as people. I think I can do something about the first. I'm not sure I'll ever do anything about the second. I never felt so good in my whole life. <laughs> When I got out of law school, well, I, I, I had a problem with whether I was going to be a lawyer. There are a lot of lawyers here tonight. I really wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a high school teacher and a coach. I wanted to be that guy that you brought your son back to school and said, son, I want you to meet Coach Cheshire. He was just the most important person in my life. <laughs> but then when I was a junior at Carolina, sophomore at Carolina, I met that woman right there. <laughs> and I fell head over heels in love with her. And we got married my junior year at Carolina. She graduated from Georgia. It's easier to get out of Georgia than Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she started taking care of me. But anyway, we got married and we were on our honeymoon and I'm the happiest man that ever walked the face of the earth. After 48 years, I still am. But we're riding down the beautiful Maine countryside. Carolyn says to me, she says, Joe, there's something I need to tell you. And I said, what's that? And she said, you're not gonna like it. I said, what is it, honey? She said, I didn't marry a high school teacher. 
<laughs> I said, you've been talking to my daddy, hasn't you? <laughs> when I practiced, started practicing criminal uh, law, I knew I wanted to be a criminal lawyer. It was, it was all I wanted to be. And uh, my dad wouldn't let me. So I went with a civil law firm, but I got on the court appointed list. My first trial was a first degree murder case. I'd never tried a case in my life. The world's different now. I represented Roscoe Bryant. He used to ride, his wife would drive a riding lawnmower and he would sit in a little flatbed behind the riding lawnmower with a cooler and they'd ride around Wendell and he'd drink beer all day. <laughs> but he was charged with murder in Homer Horton. I won that case. And I tried 35 jury trials as a civil lawyer in the five years I was with that firm. It's 35 jury trials. Can you young lawyers imagine that? 35 in my first five years. But I quickly learned that civil law was about money and criminal law was about people and prejudice and the plight of the poor and the mean and the greedy and the misunderstood and the unloved. The challenge of human emotion and the failings of man trumped money for me. I once wrote while introducing my mentor and best friend, Wade Smith, that a criminal lawyer is a person who loves other people more than he loves him or herself, who loves freedom more than the comfort of security, who is unafraid to fight for unpopular ideas and ideals, who is willing to stand up next to the uneducated, the poor, the dirty, the suffering, and even the mean, greedy, and violent, and advocate for them not just in words, but in spirit, who is willing to stand up to the arrogant, the mean-spirited, and uncaring with courage, strength, and patience, and not be intimidated, a person who bleeds a little when someone else goes to jail, who dies a little when tolerance and freedom suffer, and most important, a person who never, ever loses hope that love and forgiveness will win in the end. I found criminal law to be the ministry that I had always searched for. What in my Christian faith and education led me to this ministry? I respect the Judeo-Christian tradition, both as stated in the Old and New Testaments, but I take my personal beliefs and professional considerations straight from the teachings that Jesus gave us in the New Testament, especially as Jesus' words modify the harsh, strict Old Testament law. I choose myself to interpret the law of the Old Testament as law designed to hold a tribe living in desperation together through strict obedience to societal needs. Jesus never ridiculed the law of Moses or even tried to change it. Instead, he became a living example of how the law should be lived. And he taught that love is the heart and the reason for law. In Matthew, Jesus wrote the following. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, whoever slaps you on the right cheek Turn the left cheek to him. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, never will your father forgive yours. Boy, have we lost that in America today. Judge not lest you be judged. This is my favorite for modern prosecutions of politicians of both parties, prosecutors, judges, and defense lawyers who practice not for money, but for, not for people, but for money. Bless those who persecute you and repay no one evil for another evil. These teachings, ladies and gentlemen, we talk a lot about the criminal justice system in our society today. These teachings, when you hear people talk about the criminal justice system, these teachings have been lost in our country. In the Gospel of John, it is told the story of the adulteress. You all know this story who the elders ordered stoned to death in accordance to the then existing legal standards. Jesus famously said, you who are without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. When the lawmakers all left, Jesus told the adulteress, 
and neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Criminal defense lawyers, the ones who are properly motivated, and I've done it now for 43 years in 85 of North Carolina's 100 counties and 15 of North Carolina's states and 35 of North Carolina's federal jurisdictions, three foreign countries and two territories. Criminal defense lawyers, ones who are properly motivated, do not search to get the guilty off. We exist to hold the power of government, an often morally and politically corrupt, self-centered, judgmental entity to its burden of proof. But more importantly, if we do our job properly, we exist to do the following things. You young lawyers listen to this. We exist to forgive the sin or violation. We're not asking others to necessarily, but we exist to forgive it. We exist to understand the reason for the sin or violation. We exist to treat the reason and to minimize the loss by assisting our client in obtaining redemption, which is described by me in modern days as jobs, education, treatment, and love. I can't tell you the number of young, particularly black males who have said to me in my years of practicing law, you are the first person who ever loved me. That's our job. You are the first person that ever loved me, that ever cared about me, that ever found me a place to go, that ever believed that I could succeed. I was walking down the street the other day and this man came up to me. I, I've seen him walking up the street. He's walking up with a lady and two little girls. And he looked familiar, but I mean, I didn't, you know, I'm about to walk by him and he's, he reaches his hand and he stops me and he says, Mr. Cheshire, you don't, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, well, you look really familiar. He said, well, you represented me 16 years ago. I was in the gutter. I was a drug addict. I beat somebody up and robbed them. But you believed in me. You got me on my feet. You got me into school. You got me treatment. I want you to meet my wife and my two children. I now work at Best Buy. I've got a great job. Thank you so much. That meant more to me than any fee I've ever gotten in my life. That's why I do what I do. Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected. Criminal defendants are often morally, spiritually, economically, educationally, and emotionally dead. Is he okay? Yeah, he's fine. And we lawyers, let, let, let me just wait a minute. You need some help? Yeah, he's fine. 